So welcome to this session about uh, masking. So we'll have two talks related to masking in different contexts. So first, uh, the side channel context, and then uh, the context of um, uh, block cipher design. So the first talk uh, is about uh, leakage, uh, side channel leakage detection, and the detection of point of interest in the leakage traces, uh, and uh, with an application to mask implementation, I believe. So um, this is a joint work by Francois Durvaux and Francois Xavier Sander. And Francois Xavier will be giving the talk. So good afternoon, and thanks for the introduction. Um, and this is the outline of the talk. Essentially, I would like to start with uh, a few words about the problem statement, explain why, why the questions we tackle make sense. And then there will be three main parts. One is about the trade-offs that we face when we do leakage detection. One is about improved leakage detection tests, and uh, one is about the detection of points of interest in leakage traces. So starting with the problem statement, I think if you look at what I would call the standard side channel workflow, there are two steps that you will always do, and these are measurements and pre-processing. So measurement, it means like you acquire the power consumption or the electromagnetic radiation or the timing of your implementation. And pre-processing could be, for example, averaging, filtering, or anything that will make your signal look a little bit better. And then if you lo follow, let's say, more or less the formal path, there will probably be some kind of modeling. And by modeling, I mean that we will try to learn about the DVI's behavior or try to learn about the statistical distribution of the leakages. And then something like exploitation, where we try to make use of the information. And typically, in this field, most of the time, the goal is key recovery. And if you try to, to quantify this, we can do that more, more or less precisely. For example, we can assess the quality of a model with any kind of statistical distance, but frequently we will use the mutual information. And we can quantify the, the success rate against key recovery with exactly this success rate metric. And over the last year, there has been quite some work in, in showing that these things can be connected. So we can bound the success rate based on some estimation of the mutual information. And this is, for example, in the papers by Alexandre Duc and co-authors. And I would call this type of approach some I, I will call it the, the sound but expensive approach. And I call it expensive not so much because of time, but because it requires expertise. Like most of the time, uh, doing the modeling step and doing the exploitation step is not, not a trivial task. It requires engineering skills and so on. And it turns out that for some companies mainly who are not completely security aware, it can be too expensive. And as a result, it something different has emerged over the last years and is quite used by, by the industry. And the idea is to have something cheaper and, and admittedly more heuristic that I will denote as, as leakage detection. And in this case, you don't want to have a precise quantification of, of your security level based on success rates or whatever metric that you want to use. It's more like you want to have a, a yes or no answer. So is there some leakage in my implementation? Is there some data dependencies that I could maybe exploit or not? So what we would like to do in this, is, or what we wanted to do in this paper, is to study this question of leakage detection, understand a little bit why the tests that are proposed in the literature are so efficient, and also try to make so some connections with a very related problem, which is detection of points of interest. And here the idea is that most of the time when you have a leakage trace, it's so big, you have so many time samples, that you cannot build the model for all the time samples, and you use this selection of points of interest in order to speed up the evaluation. So very summarized, the problem, problem that we want to tackle here is what are the links and the difference between these two problems, leakage detection and detection of points of interest. So now I will start with the first question and try to explain why existing tests are, are so appealing and so fast. And I will just describe two tools for this purpose. The first one is what I believe most people would call leakage detection test in, in like nowadays. And this is a tool introduced by cryptographic research a couple of years ago, and they call it the fixed, res fixed versus random t-test. And it's easy to illustrate with the AES as an example. So essentially what you do then is you fix the 128-bit key. You will take NR traces with random plain text. You will take NF traces with fixed plain text. 
and then you will look if there is a difference between these two classes, and this you can easily do using a standard t-test, for example, a student t-test. And then, essentially, the intuition is that if you observe a large t-statistic, most likely you have some data dependency, data dependency that has been detected. So this is leakage detection, like mostly used. And just for the goal of discussion, I will describe another test that's actually much closer to the attacks that we perform in, in side channel analysis. And I will call it the raw test for correlation-based detection test. And again, with the AES as an example, what we do now is we fix the 128-bit key, we take n traces with random plain text, and we select one target, so one part of the computation, typically the SVOX output, and uh, this, this target intermediate value, you call it x, and then you just estimate Pearson's correlation coefficient between the actual leakages and a model for this target intermediate value. And of course, this means you have to build a model, but since we are in this simple case with what we call first order information, so information lying in the mean, this is something that we can easy lo e easily do using cross-validation. So the idea is you will split your number of traces in different sets of equal size, each time you, you do some cross-validation step, you, you use most of the traces for profiling, the last part for testing, and then you, you run this so that you make efficient use of all your samples to test the model. And eventually what you just do is hypothesis test, um, assuming that the Z-transform of this correlation coefficient is Gaussian distributed. So in order to, to see what why it is good or why it's not good, this leakage detection, we of course started with uh, experiments and most of what we do in this paper is actually based on experiments. And what we frequently do in this field is what we call sim simulated experiments. So this is not based on a real device. This is based on an abstract device that I assume leaks uh, the Hamming weight of eight bit values. And here on this figure, what you will see is on the x-axis, the number of traces, the number of measurements I made in my evaluation. On the y-axis, the value of my statistics, so it can be the delta for the t-test or the correlation for the rho test. And then the green curves are for the t-test for different values of the, the fixed class. And the red is the actual rho test, and the blue is some kind of abstraction, is the correlation-based test but I assume that I have the perfect model, so I don't even need the cross-validation step, and, and I directly have the right value. So I think just from this picture, of course, we can directly see what is the main advantage of this CRIT test. It's we have a very nice sampling complexity, just reflected by the fact that uh, we call something detected any time the, the statistic hits the five delta, the five sigma value that is represented by this horizontal line, and of course, um, you see that the, the most efficient curve is a, a green curve, so it's the, the t-test. And what we would like to do mainly is to understand why, t why it is the case and to find out if there's a way to improve that. So I think in order to explain things, there are two main elements that we would like to, to put forward. Uh, one is that we can easily an analyze this in terms of signal. So the signal in, in this side channel world, it just, you take all the intermediate values that you have for the leakage, and it's the variance of the average traces, okay, because we, we consider first order information. And if you do that, it's easy to see that if you take the t-test, the for example, with uh, Hamming weight four, there will be no signal at all, because the, the random class, it's going to be the, the Hamming weight of a random value, random eight bit value, it's going to be four. And if my fixed class also has Hamming weight four, there's no way I can distinguish anything but of course, if I go to the other extreme, I will have some well-chosen fixed classes so that I have more signal and I will have easier detections. And what's interesting, if I, if I take the blue thing, which is the road test with no estimation problem at all, we can observe that this, this blue curve is act actually just the average of the green curve. So this really tells in terms of signal, it's just a choice between looking for the worst case, that probably happens sometimes in the implementation, or going to for the average case, which, was, which is what the, the correlation test is practically doing. So that's one point, better signal, and the other point I'd like to put forward is that it's obviously an easier estimation problem, and that's represented by the move from the blue curve to the red curve, and the red curve is the actual uh, raw test, and that's essentially because when I do this t-test, I have only two classes to estimate, okay, the fixed class and the random class. When I do the correlation coefficient stuff, I have to estimate a model for 256 values. 
So this, this I think, is the main advantage of this CRIT test. And obviously, we are already see that, that there's obviously a cost for that. And the cost is that we will have potentially false um, negatives ref reflected by this signal that is zero here. Because if you take this fixed class, and if you're unlucky, you have only this one, then you can measure as long as you want. You will never detect anything. So that, that was for simulation. And of course, the next step when we do experimental analysis is always to move to the real world and try to see what it gives on actual leakage traces. So what I represent here is the result of the test with on the x-axis the number of time samples. So these are all the time samples of my AES execution. On the y-axis, I have the value of the statistic. So this is the delta for the t-test. This is the value of the correlation for the whole test. And, uh, yeah. and, and there's a couple of interesting things that we can notice. Maybe the, the, the good point is that if you look at this, we see that this problem of, of uh, false negatives do not hurt that much given that you make the analysis integrated over time. And it really means that if you a analyze a full AES software implementation, you have some, so many, many executions of the S-Box that sooner or later you're going to hit these actual intermediate values for which you have a good signal. And that, yeah, that's what you see here. And again, maybe I didn't make it clear enough, but this test is working with 200 traces. This test is working with 2,000 traces. So you will have this gain in sampling complexity. And, and this first point, this is already known. And I would say if you go to the, the papers from uh, CRI, they explain that, that if you run the test for large enough traces, you will have this nice behavior. And if it doesn't happen, then you just have to run the test for a couple of plain text, and you will have exactly the same effect. So false negatives are not so much a problem. I would say maybe false positives are more annoying, because if you look at these traces, what you see is on the top figure, you detect samples more or less everywhere, while on the bottom figure, you have this nice time locality. And of course, that's very appealing when, or speaking, if you think about this detection of points of interest, because whenever you want to launch a DPA after the leakage detection, the points that are important are the ones that you can actually predict via a guess it, like a divide and conquer attack. So the, the actual values that you can enumerate. And that then this is what you have here. And yeah, the other negative point I would say for the, the t-test is to a big peak for the t-test doesn't tell you in general anything about the success of a DPA attack. Right? Well, if you take the correlation value, we can actually connect the value of the correlation coefficient to the success rate of some kind of a relatively broad class of DPA attacks. Um, and this leads maybe to the first take home message. I mean, if you, if you step back and look at these two tests, what we see is that there's no, I mean, it's just a trade off between the sampling complexity and sampling complexity is best with a simple t test and informativeness. And informativeness means whether this detection tells you about something about the points that are interesting and tells you something about the success rate of the attack. So up to now, um, I just showed that these this, uh, simple t-tests are quite effective in terms of sampling complexity, and um, that we can also explain why they are effective, just reasoning about the signal and the noise. And the question naturally is whether we can do something better. And there's an easy tweak that allows, in fact, to gain in terms of signal and noise that I can, again, explain with uh, having weight leakages. So if you look at the fixed versus random t-test, and you think about the signal, the signal is reflected by the maximum Hamming weight difference that you can observe. And for 8-bit values, this is going to be 4, right? The mean is going to be 4, and then you take the extreme, 0 or 8, and that's the maximum distance difference that you can observe. So in terms of signal, you have maximum 4. And in terms of noise, you have algorithmic noise because you still have to estimate the noise of the random class, which is not a constant value. So if you think about that, then naturally, you have this simple trick where you will do rather than fixed versus random, you just do fixed versus fixed. So you pick up two random values, and you look at the distance there. And here, clearly, in terms of signal, the maximum difference is going to be 8. And maybe more interestingly, the average signal is going to be multiplied by 2. And you have no algorithmic noise at all. And this is something that we can, again, test based on real experiments. The first one is exactly the same setup. So it's a software implementation of the AES. You have these uh, x-axis with the time samples. 
the upper figure is the fixed versus random t-test with 200 traces. The bottom, the bottom trace is the uh, fixed versus fixed test with only 40 traces. And you see that, yeah, more or less you have a, a reduction of the sampling complexity by a factor of five. And interestingly, in this case of software implementation, you don't have a lot of noise, and especially no algorithmic noise at all. So most likely in this case, the gain is dominated by the, the better signal. And to be complete, we did a similar experiment for an FPG implementation, which is quite different. This time it's an F FPG implementation of a parallel implementation of the AES. And we have more or less the same type of things, like the, the fixed versus random uh, t-test. It's I gave the example with 500 traces. Here it's an example with 100 traces. So again, we have a kind of reduction by a factor of five. And most likely this time uh, it's going to be reduced, or it was reduced by the, the better noise. And this is um, probably the second take home message. If you just care about leakage detection and you want to be as fast as possible in terms of sampling complexity, essentially I would say this, this fixed versus fixed uh, alternative is interesting to do anyway, because on average, it gives you more signal and less noise. And that's what we can see uh, in experiments. And maybe note that, that this factor five, it looks not that much, but for a laboratory performing all the measurements, if you think about uh, one day of measurement, it becomes one week of measurement. So it's like in, in this world, small factors matter. So. And so up to now, what I... Um, could explain is that these t-tests are best for leakage detection. And what we've, we've also noticed is that if we want to detect points of interest, then the correlation test gains interest because you have this time locality principle that we can exploit. And the final step in the paper, what we wanted to do is try to see if there's a way to take advantage of this correlation-based test to also improve some kind of state-of-the-art uh, detection methods. And in this case, luckily, we can connect with the the name of the session because we looked at the masked implementation. Um, so a masked implementation is just a situation where my target intermediate secret, which is called here, is split in, for example, two shares. And this is the bitwise door between the two of them. And I have an implementation where I'm, I know that um, X1 and X2 are, are going to be manipulated by the device. And so our their leakage is going to appear in the leakage traces. And my goal now is to find a projection vector like this one. So it's just a vector with two windows. And I would like to detect the points of interest, meaning I would like to my two windows to cover these X1 and X2 leakages. And for this purpose, what, what we can do, and it's a very heuristic tool, it's called local search. So we start with an objective function. This is a function of the pos that is based on the position of, of the two windows that, telling, that is telling you whether what you have in the windows is significant or not. And uh, for example, in this case, it's, it should not be. So you can move the blue window, you will find no solution. You can find the red window, you will find no solution. And then you just iterate. So I restart, I still find nothing. And I do that until the point where I hit uh, here a point of interest and I will find a solution. And then there's an optimization phase which allows me to select the right size of the, the windows. OK. So if you look at this again, um, it is really just a trade-off. right? It's a trade-off between ti time and data. And this trade-off, essentially, I would say, depends on the size of your windows. Because if you take very big windows, it's easy to see that very rapidly you are going to hit the points of interest. But then you need to estimate the objective function based on the wider window. And it means it's going to be more noisy. And you will also need more samples to detect something within these windows. And based on that, I think there were at least two open three open questions that we could find in the former works. The first one I didn't discuss much is, uh, can we use non-profiled objective functions? And this is just a question whether in the evaluation of the objective function, do we need the knowledge of the key? which is feasible for an evaluation lab, but not really for a concrete adversary, or can we do everything without any key knowledge? Um, can we improve the objective function that was proposed before, and it was uh, a square of sums? And there was always this question is of how to set the threshold accurately or, or rigorously. And in fact, we can easily contribute on the three items. The first one is, well, of course, we can use a non-profiled um, objective function. And this is just this raw test. 
And this is very simple observation. In fact, it just borrows from something, some paper of uh, Reparats, Gerlich, and Vorborid a couple of years ago, so not, nothing very new here. Um, for the objective functions, the inter interesting observation is that, yes, we can use this correlation test with higher order statistical moments, and that should help. Uh, and for the, the threshold, now that we have the, this uh, reasoning based on, on the, the leakage detection, we can use this five sigma rule again and see if this gives better results. So once more, we did experiments. Um, what we looked at is uh, an implementation of the ASS box, masked and based on, on a table pre-computation. So it's a very long computation here where you have most of it, it's probably the SBox for computation, and in the end, it's the S SBox execution. Of course, when we launch the tool, we don't tell him what is doing, what is doing when. And um, this way, we could, with the, the improved tool, we could find a pair in approximately two minutes on average. And this is to compare to seven minutes using the previous objective function and 180 minutes if we had to do that exhaustively. And the good news is that we can also explain this. And as I said, it's mostly related to the size of the, the relation between the objective function and the size of, of the window. And what we I plot here is um, the estimation of the objective function based on the size of the window. We see that previously with the, the square of sum combining, uh, we could use up to 25 for the window size, but then, then we didn't have enough traces to estimate properly. While here we can seriously increase the window size essentially by a factor of three, and that's also the, the factor that we observe in the time complexity. And I think that's the, the last take home message is this correlation test is actually very suitable and very easy to implement uh, detection of points of interest in leakage traces. And just to conclude, um, yeah, the beginning probably you got it already. So if you, ju if you just want to do leakage detection, indeed these uh, t-tests are probably the best that you can do because the problem is, is as simple as can be. And probably you should use the improved version with fix versus fix because you have additional gains. But of course, it's important to be aware that there are lim limitations, and it's es essentially this, this is a test with false, false positives and with false negatives that are not so annoying in practice, but it's also very easy to conceive examples where it will be annoying, for example, if you have static leakage of, of some kind of other device. And then for the detec detection of points of interest, correlation-based evaluations are more interesting. Um, and also it, it, it connects with uh, like the, the, the sound evaluation path. Maybe one, one meta conclusion is that sometimes just, just this simple um, statistical modeling that we did, and there's nothing very fancy in the paper, leads to very natural improvements, right? Just by reasoning about signal and, no and noise, it suggests that this fixed, fixed versus fixed test is, is a nice improvement. And finally, maybe in terms of open problems, um, one thing that would be very nice is to better connect leakage detection and concrete security evaluation based on success rate, right? Um, at the moment, there's no connection at all, and, and it's kind of a choice. Either, either you want quantitative, quantita quantitative evaluation of security and you need to follow all the formal approach, or you want to go very fast and it's this leakage detection, so is there something better? Um, application of this to asymmetric crypto would be certainly interesting, and finally, I would say in general, um, how to exploit higher order and multivariate leakages in, in side channel attacks is a big open question. Thank you. Thank you, Francois Xavier. Um, we have only time for a quick question, so. Um, you have concentrated on the masking countermeasure. Another one which uh, uh, is used quite often is the time jitter in which you are adding unnecessary instructions. And then in each one of your samples, uh, the signal is dispersed over time in a different way. Have you considered ways how to adapt your scheme in order to do detection whether the uh, time jitter is sufficient in order to hide traces? Yeah. So it's a yeah, um, we did consider that in the past. So the, the, the problem that it, in general, it's more difficult because we have this choice. Either we assume this time jitter is noise and it's, this is what they call the integration method. And then you completely overstate the security level or you try to model this accurately 
and that's more in the formal path, it is possible. And then, essentially, the result is that this time jitter doesn't help much, except that if it's really huge. And, and then it's all about the question, what, what makes sense in practice, right? If you, if you do simple analysis, it looks that it helps a lot. If you do the worst case analysis, it doesn't help at all. I, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, so that's maybe the reason why we build more on masking because that, that's easier to quantify. I mean, even in front of the worst case adversary, masking survives. But yeah, that's concretely, I, I agree, it's a very useful ingredient. Okay, so our next speaker gets his 